It is a close face-to-face -face in which, on my opinion, on one side, poetry lost totally its autonomy, and on the other side, philosophy reduces the field of its own thought. Let us add that Heidegger's attempt is also a political attempt. If German poetry, and especially older Lien's poetry, are the place where the true presence of being is given, it designates Germany like the country where the fate of being is at stake. The German nation must exist around the idea that its country is a kind of chosen place. A supposed poetry of being must give consistence to a political subject, the German nation. And we know that for Heidegger, this new political consistence of Germany coincided, alas, for a time with Nazi politics. So one can meditate the real importance of the settlement of the quarrel between philosophy and poetry. Its consequences are major consequences as well for philosophical thought as for politics. And this is the reason why I am so interested uh, today in the question of poetry. I would like to add that most opinions about poetry can be referred to one of these three philosophical, of, of three philosophical positions. Sorry, I spoke about two, but there was one more. The third position is a position of ignorance, which turns its back to poetry as frivolous or strictly decorative. Most opinion about poetry, the opinion that you share, can be referred to one of these three positions. And if I follow Jacques Roubaud, even among poets, the three positions exist since he distinguishes among them first what he calls the Homeric posture for which poets are masters of truth. I am not sure that I would recognize Homer as the leader of this tendency, but this is another question. Another question. Second, the Orphic posture, the posture of the inspired poet, the furious, as he put it, a variant of which is the spontaneous poet. And the third one is a posture he called the Malherbian poet, from the name of a French poet, which refers to the idea that poetry would be purely decorative. If I invited Jacques Roubaud this year, the reason is that he is, in my, to my opinion, the most vigorous defender I know of what he calls the autonomy of poetry. And my conviction is that philosophy itself must today be relied, allier, you say rely, yes, to the autonomy of poetry. That is to say, it must admit the absolute singularity and importance of poetry as such. Why? I won't answer myself directly here, since what is important tonight is to hear is to hear Jacques Roubaud and to be attentive to his poems. But I will answer by quoting Jacques Roubaud's statements, some of Jacques Roubaud's statements, which, with which I totally agree and for which I want to thank him because they are as rare as enlightening about poetry. Of course, I am reorganizing this statement, giving them my own order, with which maybe you won't agree. First statement, the first statement, important in my opinion, is about his own existence as a poet. He says, I think that poetry can continue to be practiced to continue. This is a decisive point. And somewhere else he says, I am against the posture of renunciation. And he had that he says this in his own name, which is both courageous and very important. The second statement is a signature. 
his signature in some places. Jacques Roubaud, composer of mathematics and poetry. I like very much the, the link between mathematics and poetry. Third, the third statement is about poetry, but I will gather here several statements, in fact, and uh, it is my own order in the, in the list. First, what poetry says cannot be said otherwise. Second, poetry says what it says by saying it. Third, poetry says nothing, poetry says. Fourth, what poetry says is what every poem says. And the reciprocal, in every poem, poetry says. Fourth statement about poetry and language. First, what poetry says cannot be said otherwise. Second, poetry is now. A poem is now means that a poem can only be grasped in that way as if it were pronounced now, composed and perceived now. Three, being memory of language, poetry is premonitory of the future of language. For poetry is always, always separate in language. It imposes a separation. And now I will ask a question. Is it mere coincidence if the contemporary poet who defends so, so well the autonomy of poetry is also a poet who writes, I quote him, not so long ago, when the Berlin Wall had just fallen, a sort of equivalent is currently being built on slightly different borders, the Schengen Agreement. And an another quotation, I have remained for a certain extent a patriot in a latent sort of way. This explains at least in part the deep disgust I feel for racism xenophobia, le penism, and my shame when confronted with one particular strain of French public opinion. According to me, it is not mere coincidence. And this is a last reason why I am so glad to hear Jacques Roubault with you tonight. Thank you. Well, uh, thank you very much for that very generous uh, presentation of my, my position. Um, I, I do agree with my position, and, uh, but I w w would rather agree with Plato, generally. So uh, I'll say a few words about myself, very, very short. Um, I'm 74 years old. I'm a multi-grandfather. I, I spent a lot of my, my life being a composer of mathematics and poetry, but I am now retired from mathematics, but not, I hope, from poetry. So I'm going to read a few, a few texts. Um, uh, I read them all in English, and some in French and English. So I'll start with something that's uh, kind of prose in, um, in French, in English. Correspondence, letter one. I've just received your last letter, <coughs> and I'm immediately replying. You've asked if I have received your last letter and if I intend to reply. If I may, please let me point out that you having sent your last letter 